Chapter Eleven of Kilgallen Park by Neil Boynton S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Eleven, Low Bridge. Claude Hazard was just about to yell the familiar "Aum" as he approached the scene entitled "Caesar Landing in Britain" when he changed his tactics. It would be better to creep up and surprise whoever was there ahead of him this Monday morning. So, dropping on all fours, as he came out the trap door from the swimming pool building, he crawled in approved Red Indian style across the warm, yielding sands. When he came to the edge of canvas, he peeked through a rip, and then the surprise was all on his part. There, in the secret den of the tearing tigers of Kilgloom Park, was a sandy-haired boy. What was more horrible, this stranger was busily engaged in eating the hot dogs that Angela Daly had catched there to be used after the morning swim. Claude's first impulse was to yell out. Then he chucked that idea violently. No, he would get Big Al Dundee and have this thief arrested. Claude was backing away to carry out this plan, when he suddenly had a better idea. Arrest nothing. Get Angelo and G.T. and let the tearing tigers themselves attend to this robber. Anyway, it was just as well Big Al did not know about the den. You never can tell about detectives. You might want to hide out here yourself sometime. Putting this more prudent plan into execution, Claude softly crept back to the opening in the canvas. This time even the keen ears of Red Indians would not have detected his withdrawal. Halfway back to the trapdoor, Claude had another idea. He retraced his way on hands and knees till he could look into the den again. The strange, sandy-haired boy had finished the tearing tigers after swim bite, and he was running across the sands of the scene. Claude watched him lift a loose piece of tin rock scenery and crawl under it. When Claude Hazard was satisfied that he knew the hiding place of this thieving stranger, he crept silently into the den till he came to the loose board under which, in a tin box, he and Angelo kept their cap pistols. Taking out both pistols and an ample supply of caps, Claude heard a distant i oom coming from the direction of the bathing houses. It was repeated. By custom, any tearing tiger in the den should reply, but Claude stationed himself where he could be seen as soon as Angelo appeared at the trapdoor. When Angelo daily straightened up, he was surprised to see Claude making frantic signals for silence. None of the flax and wig figures of the ancient Britons overhead on the ledge were stiller than Angelo daily as he came forward with Buddy riding precariously on his shoulder and the black furred ferocity at his heels. What's the matter? His lips formed the words. Claude hastily told him. Angelo looked at the eloquent empty place, where he had catched the hot dogs. There was not the slightest doubt but that they had been taken. And I put two hunks of chocolate cake there, too. If those boxing triplets did that, out of the club they go. No, it was not the Lees, but a sandy-haired strange boy, and I know where he is hiding out right now. How big is he? You and I can lick him. Then let's start. Angelo looked around for anything club-shaped. Claude stayed his search. He doesn't know these are fake. Claude produced the two pistols. We'll hold him up and tie him up and let G.T. deal with him. Okay. He's lying hidden right across the set under that loose tin rock. See the one about ten feet this side of the opening in the old mill? Angelo nodded and reached out a hand for one of the cat pistols. He directed, You wait here till you see me come out of the old mill over his head. Then we'll both jump him. Here, take this rope to tie him up. To Buddy. You stay put here till I come back, or Papa will spank and spank hard. The threat was sufficient, and Buddy sprang to the ledge with the ancient Britons. Angelo ran back and disappeared through the trapdoor. Several minutes later, Claude saw him beckoning from the opening in the old mill. Claude, with his drawn automatic in his right hand, raced across the sand of the set. Angelo leaped down, and the boy stood over the loose tin. Not a sound came from the other side of it. Angelo kicked the tin and warned, Say, boy, we have you covered. Come on out. There was a startled sound from the hiding place, and then a frightened voice begged, Please don't shoot. I'm coming. The sooner the safer you'll be, warned Angelo in a deep tone. The tin lifted and a sandy head appeared. Then a dirty face looked up into the mouths of two businesslike looking automatics. Please don't shoot. Hands up. In Angelo's voice was a grim warning that brought prompt obedience. The sandy-haired boy was about Angelo's and Claude's age. 
he was dressed in a soiled khaki shirt and more soiled knickers. The two Coney Islanders wasted little time in grabbing him, and while Claude held his gun directed at the boy's stomach, Angelo stepped forward, and in a few seconds he had the boy's hands tied securely behind his back. Then he prodded him forward with his automatic across the sands toward the den. "'Now, son,' began Angelo, in Big Al's best, third-degree manner with the prisoner, "'suppose you tell us what you are doing here.' The strange boy held a solemn silence. "'What did you steal our hot dogs for? I saw you taking them,' Claude put in. "'You would have done the same if you had been as hungry as I am.' "'When did you eat last?' Angela wanted to know. "'Not since yesterday morning.' At this news, Angela's eyes clouded with sympathy. "'Well, I don't blame you a bit for taking our eats. I'd have done the same, only sooner,' he admitted." The strange boy sensed that he had an appreciative audience of at least one, and he began to speak. "'I've been hiding here since day before yesterday. Here in Kilgallen Park.' This from Claude. "'Here in the park,' replied the boy. "'Where?' Angelo demanded. "'I bought a ticket for the old mill last Saturday, and riding around in the boat, I saw this scene, and it looked like a good place to hide out, so I jumped out of the boat.' And when I came around that canvas wall, I saw your den. Then you two came in. Remember, it was about six Saturday. I just got under the canvas in time. Remember we did. Claude and I remember now that I thought at the time there was something queer about the den. Angela had a sudden thought. Where did you eat? I didn't, confessed the boy. When it got dark, I came back to your lean-to, and it was warm, so I slept there all night. In the morning, I was so hungry that I could hardly wait till the old mill boats were running. When they started up, I dropped into one and came out the exit. Then I bought some sandwiches and hot dogs and chocolate. You must have had some money. Where did you get it? Angelo wanted to know. I took it out of my bank at home. The sandy-haired boy saw the suspicious look in Angelo's eye and added belligerently, No, I didn't steal it. We'll skip that. What then? I nosed around the scene, and I found that dandy hiding place over there where you found me. Whenever I heard one of you park boys coming to your den, I hid there. It was a good thing this weather was warm and not rainy, Angelo declared. But what I want to know is why all this secret camping out in this set of the old mill? The strange boy looked at Angelo and Claude. Then he whispered, I gotta tell somebody, and you two seem pretty decent. I, I killed a boyfriend. Angelo and Claude sprang away as though the speaker was a poison snake. What? What? All right, go and tell the police. They'll get me anyway, and it might as well be now. Angelo beckoned to the bench in the lean-to. Come on over here and tell us the whole story. Maybe we'll help you. How about it, Claude? Sure. The desire to unburden his secret proved too strong. The strange boy sat between the two park boys and said, I'm Art Meggs, and last Saturday morning I was in the apartments of my chum, Packy Linehan. His dad is the detective, and Packy was showing me his dad's revolver. I took it, and the next second went off bang, and Packy collapsed like a, like a sack on the floor. I heard his mother scream and come running from the next door down the hallway. I dropped the revolver and scooted out the back door and down the stairs, I ran all the way to my apartments on 82nd Street, Manhattan. Nobody was home, and I knew the police would come and get me for murder. So I took all the money in my bank. There must have been four dollars. Packy and I had been doing kilgling the Saturday before, and I thought of the old mill as a good place to hide out in. So I took the Sea Beach Express and came right to the island. I've been here ever since, Art Mags concluded abruptly. Well, wait a minute. You say you killed a boy, and it seems to me you didn't wait to see if you did or not. Maybe that bullet went into the wall, and this Packy just dropped from fright or fainted or something like that. He was dead, declared Art earnestly. I saw him, and the stain was spreading from him. Stain nothing, objected Angelo. That may have come from a scalp wound. You two keep quiet while I think out what we should do. Claude did not need any urging to silence for he had moved to the edge of the bench and sat there watching with large eyes the self-confessed boy murderer. Angelo thought hastily about getting Big Al. 
No, he would take this art to 8th Street Station. Captain, then. No, Cap is too busy to be bothered. Chubby. No, he go to Big Al. Wish Crag. G.T. Yes, he's the chap. Angelo slapped his knee in approval. I have it. I'll get my big brother. G.T. will know what is the right thing to do. In the meantime, Claude and I will scout around and get you something decent to eat and drink. You stay right here till we get back. Art Mags had not the slightest intention of leaving his hiding place. When Angelo and Claude were in the long corridor with the bathhouses either side, Claude asked, Say, he's a murderer. Shouldn't we go to the police? Police nothing. Just wait and see if he really killed that boyfriend. I think he was too nervous to shoot straight. What we will do is to get some food from Katie, our cook, and keep this art from starving. Imagine living on sandwiches and hot dogs and chocolate and old mill water for three days. And having to play low bridge all the time, put in Claude. The two found G.T., Wish, and Chubby on Kilgloom Boulevard before the naval show. They were about to take toy destroyers on a cruise, and they did not want to be bothered. But Angela whispered to G.T., and at once he called off his part in the proposed cruise. Sure, I'll help him, the poor kid, commiserated G.T. daily. Wait till I tell Chubb and wish that I can't come this morning. G.T. came back to where the two boys were waiting in less than three minutes. I didn't tell them about our guests in the den. The less know it at present, the better. You go back to this art, and I'll be over with what food I can get out of Katie or the Frigidaire. G.T. crossed the park boulevard and disappeared up the stairs that led to the Daly's private apartments. He must have had a winning way with the family cook, for almost as soon as Angelo and Claude got back to the den in the old mill scene, G.T. appeared. He had a napkin full of fruit and generous ham sandwiches and the thermos bottle of cool milk. Art Mags began eating while the introductions were going on. G.T. asked, What is the phone number of your dead friend, Packy Linehan? Art gave it. Listen, they won't know who I am, so I'll get his folks on the phone and see how things are. If you need any more food, Mags, Angelo here will get it from our cook. He has a better connection in our kitchen than I have. Angelo grinned and did not deny his influence in that quarter. G.T. went back to his dad's private office. Captain Daly was not there, so G.T. dialed the number Art Mags had given him. When a voice replied, he asked, Butterfield 65260? Yes. May I speak with Packy Linehan? You are, came the response. That ends the murder theory, thought G.T. So far, so good. Then he said, Now, listen, Packy, you don't know me, but I happen to be a friend of a friend of yours. Yes, who? Art Mags. Art Mags, where is he? His folks are about crazy, and the police are looking for him. Just at present, he is eating the best meal he has had in three days. He still thinks that shot killed you. No, it didn't. Only a scalp wound that stunned me. I'm as good as ever. Where is he? Well, he won't believe that you are not a ghost till he sees you, and you give him a couple of healthy punches. I'll do that, gladly. Where is he? I have him secure. Listen carefully. Say nothing to his folks just yet, but come down to Coney Island on the next Sea Beach Express. Do you know where Kilgloom Park is? <laughs> like every boy in greater New York. Then come to the executive offices. They are to the left, at the upper end of Kilgloom Boulevard, just next to the mountains of the Moon Coaster. I know where they are. Ask for Georgie Daly. That's my name. Are you a son of Captain Daly? Half of all the sons he's got. All right, Georgie Daly, I'll be right down. You hold Art Mags till I get there, and then give me three seconds to prove that he did not kill me, and he'll believe me all right, all right. We'll hold Art, don't you fear. Bye. G.T. hung up, grinning broadly. Angela Daly met G.T. in the middle of the court of Kilgloom. He was trotting importantly to the family private compartments. Buddy rode on his shoulders, and Ferocity stepped in his master's shadow. "'What's the trouble now?' asked G.T. "'That Meg's boy is still hungry, and I am going back to Kitty for more eats.' "'If you have any trouble with her, just hunt me up. I was phoning to Meg's dead chum, and that corpse is on his way down to the island.' Angela brightened. This promises to be good. I want to have a grandstand seat when those two meet. Well, you get him more food and then hold him in the den till Packy Linehan comes. I'll call you, Shirley. Come on, Ferocity. Maybe there will be a tidbit for you, though where you'll put it after the fish breakfast I saw you eat an hour ago, I don't know. 
Buddy, you let go of my ear, or Papa will spank. The trio departed, and G.T. stayed in the executive offices, counting loose silver during the next hour and a half. His vigil was rewarded when he heard a boy about his own age inquiring at the window for Georgie Daly. Here he is. Are you Packy Linehan? Guilty. G.T. ducked around the door and shook hands with the boy. Where is Art? was Packy's first question. He's where he has spent the past three days. That is, in the old mill scene called Caesar Landing in Britain. We park boys have a den there, and this morning my younger brother and his chum happened to discover Art. They covered him with their toy pistols and then tied him up. Later they loosened and fed him. Come on, and you'll prove to him what a poor shot he is. I'm mighty glad to do that. I was to blame ever letting Art full with Dad's service revolver. It's taught me a lesson. Captain, my father, keeps a gun in his desk up there. G.T. pointed to the upper windows of the executive offices, and his first order to this office boy of his was to keep three nautical miles away from that gun at all times. I'd get my discharge if I looked at that gun. The two had come to the entrance to the old mill. G.T. spied Angelo, and he called him over. How's your prisoner? After he ate, he fell asleep. I guess he didn't sleep much last night. Good. Come on, commanded G.T., stepping into an empty mill boat. The other two stumbled in. G.T. pushed the boat off into the mill wheel current. At once they were in darkness, more intense after coming in from the blinding sunshine. They glided by dimly lit set after set. When passing the Inferno set, G.T. related the recent escapade of the missing ape, Jack Dempsey. Gosh, what doesn't get lost in this old mill? exclaimed Angelo. They began to call to some of his personal friends as they bumped by the jungle scene. What are they saying, Angelo? asked Packy delightedly. Oh, they want more food, as usual, but they won't get a bite till tomorrow morning. No monkeys in this amusement park ever die of starvation, put in Angelo. But it is always a wonder to me why the whole shooting match do not die of... What do you call that when a fellow eats too much, G.T.? Not gluttony. Cute something. Acute indigestion. That's it. None of them will ever die of that. Again the boat was in a long, winding, dark tunnel. Then light began to strengthen ahead, and they were abreast of the Caesar landing in Britain set. G.T. held the boat while the other two boys scrambled out. Go ahead and see how the land lies, Angelo. Angelo tiptoed across the sands and peeked around the end of the artificial cliff. He came running back. Stretched out, dead to the world. Good. You let me waken him, bagged Packy Lenahan. He crossed the scene in the lead and then disappeared into the den. The two dailies heard a scream, and the next moment Art Mags came dashing into G.T.'s arms. He grabbed the frightened boy. I seen a ghost. Ghost nothing, shouted Angelo. You're a poor shot. You missed him, that's all. Well, turn around and you'll see him again. G.T. twisted Art and he was gazing at the boy he thought he had murdered. Packy picked up a piece of gray sacking and draped it about his shoulders. Now he advanced with his right index finger pointed accusingly at Art. But Art Meggs was wide awake now, and the sight of his pal's white sport shoes and the broad grin that was spreading ever further across his features reassured him. Packy, you're not dead! Art struggled out of G.T.'s embrace and hurled himself on Packy Linehan. The two went down in a wild tussle of sheer delight. Now when you would-be murderer and victim get through ruining each other, said G.T., my advice for you is to take the next Sea Beach Express back to Manhattan and report to Art's parents. Then they will be able to take part in the grand old family reunion. Packy struggled up and shaking the sand from his clothing was about to speak when Angela shooed all the boys behind the cliff. Out of sight, here come some passengers in an old mill boat. The boys vanished into the den. Packy said, What you just said, George Daly, is a sensible thing to do. The Missing Persons Bureau have a general alarm out for this poor shot, and it will be better for his father to go with him to our precinct station. Come on home, Art. But at the main entrance, better luck awaited the two Manhattan boys. Packy sighted his Uncle Phil's car passing on Surf Avenue. Uncle Phil pulled into the curb at the wild shouts, and learning the state of the affair, insisted on taking the boys direct to Art's home. G.T. and Angela waved the reunited chums goodbye and invited them to come back another day. I wonder, remarked Angelo doubtfully, if that art is in for a banquet or a licking. Very likely both, G.T. observed prophetically. End of chapter 11
Recording by Maria Therese.